Hi, and welcome to In Search of Insight, Nootropics Depot's monthly podcast. I'm your podcast host, Erica, and sitting next to me is our product specialist at Nootropics Depot, Emil. Hey, everyone. Today, Emil and I are going to be telling you all about Relievex, Nootropics Depot's pain management supplement stack. And Emil was a big part in creating Relievex, so who better to talk with about this product than the creator himself? Yeah, it'll be fun to get into this one. And... Normally, we take the supplement on camera, and we won't do it right now because we've actually already taken it. Uh, We started recording about half an hour ago, some noise was happening, we had to reset, it's now half an hour later. Uh, I don't want to take another dose because I'm feeling it pretty strongly already after half an hour. I think if I take another dose, I'm going to be a little bit unfocused throughout this episode. This is an interesting opportunity, though, because right from the start, I can also start telling you how it actually feels. And both Eric and I have been sick for the last week, week and a half. Uh, We're still a little bit sore, so we were actually really looking forward to recording this because we got to take Relievex. We've been taking Relievex here and there, too, for the pain, uh, just relaxing our bodies a little bit because we're a bit tense. We haven't moved as much as we normally would, so we're just a bit stiff, and this helps loosen you up a little bit. And we'll get into why that is, both from a physical standpoint and a mental standpoint. And then a little bit later in the podcast, we're also going to talk to you about all of the ingredients that are in Relievex Mm -hmm. and why they were selected and what they're actually doing to contribute to that pain management effect. And we're going to talk about the specific mechanisms of action so you understand the science behind the product itself. Um, But before we get into all of that really intense, detailed discussion... Let's talk about how we're feeling, because I'm already feeling the effects of the Relievex pretty significantly, and Mm -hmm. I think you are too. I am. Uh, So earlier today, I I honestly was a a little bit on edge. We we have a lot going on today, and we're recording the podcast. That always makes me feel a a little bit nervous, in a good way. It, It makes me quite focused, actually. But... Now, going into this, I feel super relaxed. I, there's a, a, a sensation of warmth that's coming from the supercritical Boswellia extract, which is hitting the TRPV3 receptor. This is a receptor that normally gets activated by warmth. Uh, so it also kind of gives you the experience of warmth when you take it orally and then activate those receptors without there actually being warmth around. Um, so that's one of the big things I'm feeling currently, kind of up the back of, of my spine going up to my neck and in my head it feels kind of warm and as that warmth is building I can feel my muscles relaxing which is coming from the GABAergic and cannabinergic effects of this stack. So this is really what, what we're doing. We're we're dialing in the effects on the vanilloid receptors, like the TRPV3 receptor, also the TRPV1 receptor. We'll touch on those a little bit later. Those are very important receptors for the overall perception of pain. And then we're stacking that vanilloid mechanism with a GABAergic mechanism, and then stacking those two mechanisms with a cannabinergic mechanism. And then there's also some mechanisms in here that attenuate inflammation and oxidation, which are all very central to pain as well. And if you want to learn more about what pain is and how it works, we have another podcast episode that Erica can link in the description below. It's quite long. We go really into the the science of pain. We won't be getting that specific here because I want to highlight Relievex and, and how we formulated it and what all of the different ingredients do a little bit more on this episode. But one big differentiation that needs to be made is that you have actual pain. You have a site of injury, you have inflammation and oxidation there, and and that produces the sensation of pain that we then interpret psychologically. And then we go, ow, that hurts. This is good because we can modulate that psychological out that hurts what if we just don't realize it hurts so the the pain is there the the site of injury is there Uh, pain is by the way very important because it tells you something is wrong if you don't experience pain you'll just constantly injure yourself so it's good the problem is when we injure ourselves we know it hurts that was a bad thing now we want to dampen that pain a little bit so we can actually go on with our daily lives and recover a little bit more quickly. 
So we can modulate that psychological experience. And that was a big part of Relievix, which is also why we can really feel the mental effects, which are they're quite mood boosting and quite relaxing. Um, I actually maybe even prefer Relievix more as like a relaxing mood boosting supplement. It's a really nice one to take after a busy work day. Take some Relievix, put on a movie, melt away into just a nice warm pleasant feeling melt away the stress of the day and, and maybe some of that physical tension that's built up because you've been shouting at people on the phone things are going wrong fedex didn't deliver your package uh it's it's raining and the rain is coming into your house whatever it may be the stresses of the day at the end of the day yeah it's nice to melt it away with something like relievex um, and then it also helps with pain and it helps with sleep too. So it's, it's quite a versatile supplement. Uh, the real inspiration behind it though was pain is just a, a, an experience that all of us have. Uh, I think we all know someone or ourselves that struggles with pain on a day-to-day -day basis. That's definitely the case for me. Uh, my father has a, a hernia, so he deals with back pain. I've helped him there a lot with various types of supplements. And my mom has arthritis in her knees, so she has quite a bit of pain there too. And I've been able to help her a lot with supplements as well. And within our office, we see this a lot too. A lot of our colleagues that we've worked with for many years struggle with pain. And we are kind of in that position where we can make a product that works well for them. So it's a very... Uh, important supplement that we made because currently a lot of our family members are taking Relievix and they're having really good effects with it. Um, I recently gave a bottle to my mom and she's been taking it whenever her pain comes back a little bit more in her knee and Relievix. She called me up the other day and said this, this stuff is magic. Like it's just an off button for pain. Uh, I honestly haven't experienced the effects of Relievix that strongly, but I've heard that from quite a few people that it just turns off pain um, and then makes you feel nice and relaxed. So what's not to love about that? Today we're going to talk about the reasons why it's so effective for so many of you. And I think part of the reason why is because Relievex covers the psychological elements of experiencing and perceiving pain, but also addresses the actual physical uh, phenomenon that's happening when we get injured uh, or when we have a wound and the inflammation and oxidation that occurs at that site which is then going to create pain so that we can then do something about it to stop the pain and to start the healing. One thing I'm curious to talk about and maybe this will come up through the podcast is with this perception of pain and how our perception of pain is related to nerve damage and pain mm -hmm. that we get from um, for example repetitive stress injuries this is something that mm -hmm. I have experience with as a musician and um, that experience of pushing my body to the point where I actually damage my ability to sense pain or to sense tension and inflammation and I've experienced numbness and mm -hmm. this is going you know beyond a certain threshold of pain to the point where I actually can't feel it anymore and thankfully, I've been able to address these kind of nerve pain and nerve injuries um, through a bunch of different methods. But one really central element of addressing nerve pain is to be able to relax enough to feel and perceive the tension or the damage that's there. And I can feel already from this dose that we've taken of Relievex that I just feel a lot more relaxed than I would in a normal podcast recording. And that element of relaxation helps me become aware of the places that I'm sensing pain in my body. And then because I'm aware of it, I'm able to focus on how I can change my posture, breathe deeper and relax to basically put that focus and attention into that area, which is causing pain, which I do know is going to help address and get rid of that pain. I'm not exactly sure how to explain it to you, but I know that it works because I have experienced it myself. So perhaps this conversation that we're having on the podcast can also help those of you who experience pain from repetitive stress injuries or nerve pain, um, or even give some insight into sort of the origins of chronic pain, because a lot of this is 
related to how we perceive pain, not just the severity of the injury. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you make some very good points there. And But one point I will also want to make is if you are having nerve pain or a repetitive stress injury, the best way to prevent the pain is to prevent that repetitive stress injury from occurring. Mm. So, yes, you can take Relievex. It, it's going to help with the overall sensation of pain. It might allow you to put yourself in a mental state where it's easier to deal with the pain, to maybe do some stretching and things like that. Um, but the big thing to remember is that Relievex is masking the pain. It's not getting rid of the origins necessarily of the pain, although there are some mechanisms of action built in within it that could maybe help speed up wound healing or just help you recover from an injury. But if you do generally have a, a chronic pain disorder that's being caused by something that could be helped by physical therapy, please keep going to physical therapy, but maybe take something like Relievex to help relax your muscles a little bit and make some of those strategies more successful. And I know that's also kind of where you were going because you do a lot of stretching, and, and but I just wanted to make that clear that this is not going to solve your issues. It's going to help you deal more with the pain issue. And that's why we also call this pain management. Uh, we don't call it necessarily pain treatment. We're, we're not treating the pain we are managing the experience of pain and or I, even more explicitly a pain killer which is what we call mm -hmm. things that we would buy from the drugstore and this is not that this is not going to kill the pain but well perhaps it, we... it will it will just like an over-the-counter pain killer those are also not going to help you recover they're just getting rid of the pain. So, yes, this this is similar. But uh, but something that I want to mention before we move on into the real like ingredients of the of Relievex is that there's also something important. We all probably have heard this before and I think there's some truth to it, no pain, no gain. And what I what I mean and why I'm bringing this up in the first place is that we need pain. You've oh, already yeah. mentioned pain this. Pain is very important. Pain is really important. And when we experience pain and that allows us to respond to our environment or respond to something that's happened to us and then heal from it, let's say we gain, we regain a sense of strength or, or we, we regain like uh, health or, or we close the wound or whatever it is. Um, so how important it, is it for us to actually perceive that pain in the healing process versus how important is it for us to relax enough to sort of mitigate that perceived pain to help us heal? And maybe we'll answer mm -hmm. this question through the podcast, maybe not, but this is something that's on my mind as well. No, I, I think it's definitely in the, the healing process. It's important that you still experience pain. Like, let's say you're doing some physical therapy, you're doing some stretches, and you're taking something that just completely gets rid of pain. Pain is also telling you, hey, buddy, you stretched a little bit too far there. Ow, that hurts. If that signal isn't there anymore, you're just going to stretch yourself into a new injury. So pain is important. Now, if the pain is preventing you from doing the most minor stretches or physical activity, then, yeah, if you take something like Relievex, you get rid of that sensation of pain, you're able to move a little bit more, you're, you're still going to be feeling the pain. It's just not going to be as bothersome. Uh, then I think you can get yourself to a point where, yeah, you can go exercise a little bit more, you can have a, a, a stretching session or whatever it may be. And to reflect back on my own experiences and what I've seen for example with my mom when she had her issues with her knee it would prevent her from being physically active and that increased the pain over time because if we're physically active things are moving we're building up our strength in general that seems to be positive for the experience of pain. Now, if you're experiencing so much pain and stiffness and inflammation that it's not allowing you to go out for a walk and you're just sitting at home all day long, then that pain that's there is probably going to get worse. You might even build up some other different types of pain that are related to a sedentary lifestyle. So for my mom, taking things that are helping her knee pain are allowing her to move more. And by moving more, it's 
just kept her knee healthy and functioning and everything is good now. Um, and she can go for long walks and that's good for her overall health. So I think that's where pain management supplements really come in handy because a lot of people have somewhat debilitating pain issues that then prevent them from going for a walk, going to a concert, uh, taking a, a holiday, uh, driving to work, all of these different things. So again, another important uh, thing for us that we were thinking about, that pain is not just physical, pain is, is quite mental as well. Um, you know, maybe you also just don't want to go out for a walk if you're in pain because you're telling yourself, if I go out for a walk, it's just going to hurt more. Maybe the in actuality, it's going to help you. And taking something like Relievix, you take kind of that, that pain away a little bit. You have a nice relaxed mindset. Maybe that allows you to go out for a walk a little bit more readily. So, but uh, it's an interesting concept pain. Uh, it, it, I think it's it's a very difficult topic because if, if you're stressed, you experience pain more, so th there might not be that much pain. So if you get rid of stress, then maybe you're getting rid of your pain. If you're not sleeping enough, you're probably going to experience pain a little bit more. If you're not eating a healthy diet, you might have more inflammation, and that's going to make it pain much more pronounced because you're geared up for inflammation and you don't have as many factors to help you deal with that inflammation. So lots of different things to consider. This will probably be a very long podcast if we go into all of that. So I think we should start getting into the ingredients now. Yes, let's talk about Relievex and how this is actually helping yeah. us to manage pain. We could have a philosophical uh, discussion about pain uh, for hours. I, I think that would be really interesting. Uh, just th think of like all of the the impacts of pain throughout society and now what we're seeing with the Sackler family and, and all of the harm they've caused just because at the end of the day they're trying to help people get rid of their pain and then that's caused a huge opioid epidemic uh, it's it's such a society so societally <laughs> it's a it's a hard issue um yeah it's it's it, for, for example culturally there are big differences too like in the netherlands i really grew up with this like you should experience pain like that pain is what makes you human like it's good you you shouldn't be blocking the pain when i first moved to canada and then later to the us there was a whole different sentiment pain is just never okay you should never be in pain you should always be comfortable so at the tiniest sign of pain you're getting a painkiller and when i broke my wrist in the us i immediately got given a lot of very very powerful opioid analgesics that i really shouldn't have been given uh, in my opinion because the pain really wasn't that bad in the netherlands you would never be giving that like if your doctor gives you an ibuprofen or a paracetamol you're lucky uh, so there's also big cultural differences there of how we experience pain and, and that just makes pain difficult there's another interesting element of what you're talking about which is that you were you grew up partially in the netherlands but then you came to the came to canada and then the u.s as an adult and your your experience with pain and how pain is treated is also from the perspective of an adult mm -hmm. but uh, for me I grew up in the US and I you know had my fair share of falls off my bike or injuries from figure skating or um, other kinds of injuries and other kinds of pain and I think there's also some level of truth to what you're saying people in the U.S. like to be comfortable and they want to get rid of any sign or any any inkling of pain at the very first moment. Uh, but then sometimes there's also this flip side, this other extreme, where you push yourself beyond the point of pain because uh, the goal or the product that you're working towards is more important than yourself, more important than your own sensation of pain or of stress or of exhaustion. And this can cause some major injuries and also some major kind of behavioral issues where you ignore really serious pain or you ignore um, chronic pain that's happening every day or from a certain activity to the point where it gets so bad that it prevents you from being able to just go for a walk or live your normal life. 
um, because you are removed from your actual sensation of that pain. And this is also an interesting part of the psychological part. But we're still <laughs> beating around the bush. Now we're getting we have to it's stop. philosophical again. <laughs> and we've got to go really deep into what is actually in this relief act. So let's just start with the ingredients. Yeah, that, that's going to make it really easy. I'm just going to list them all off in one go, uh, and then I'll go through them one by one. So the first ingredient we have in there is a kava extract, uh, our kava extract. Let me let me just read them in order actually. So kava extract, 500 milligrams of that. That's that's quite a decent dose. Uh, then we have our lemon balm extract that's standardized to 1% rosmarinic acid, and we have 250 milligrams of that. Then we have our supercritical ginger extract, uh, standardized to 10% ginger oils and show galls, and there's 200 milligrams of that in relief X. Then we have our micronized palmitoyl ethanolamide, or some of you might know it as PEA, and we have 200 milligrams of that. And then we have our maca extract that's standardized to 5% maca mines, and there's 100 milligrams of that in here. Then we have our supercritical CO2 boswellia extract that has been standardized for more of those volatile compounds that have very interesting effects on the vanilloid system, like the TRPV3 receptor that produces that warming effect that we were talking about earlier. And then we have tetrahydromagnolol, which is a very unique compound that's found in small amounts in magnolia bark. Uh, it's derived from magnolol. If you hydrogenate magnolol, then you get tetrahydromagnolol. And the, the change that happens in terms of pharmacodynamics is that magnolol is a very weak cannabinoid CB1 and CB2 agonist. Tetrahydromagnolol, on the other hand, is much, much stronger. It is quite a strong cannabinoid CB2 agonist and, and a very, very weak cannabinoid CB1 agonist. And that has a very unique effect on pain. Uh, as far as we know, we're the only people who are also working with tetrahydromagnolol. And when you consume magnolol from magnolia bark, you would actually have some conversion happening within your body during metabolism that turns some of this magnolol into tetrahydromagnolol. So we're just skipping that step and giving you straight tetrahydromagnolol, which is a very unique and novel ingredient. And then the last ingredient in here is piperine. That's there to enhance the bioavailability of everything. But piperine also has pain modulating effects. So there's a, a dual use for it in this product. So let's start with the kava extract. A kava is a plant that's been in use with, with humans for probably thousands of years. The, the Polynesians were first using it. It, it might have originated from around Papua New Guinea because you see an interesting thing about kava is that it doesn't grow wild. Uh, you have to propagate it. So a human basically has to take a cutting and, and grow kava from these cuttings. If it wasn't for human intervention, kava as we know it wouldn't exist. If you look in Papua New Guinea, you do see a very closely related plant that probably was where Piper Mephisticum, kava, actually came from. So this is kind of like a wild uh, piper, pepper species that resembles kava. So they think it kind of comes from there. They're not totally sure. We've, we have uh, this thing called historical amnesia. We just forget, you know, humans have been around for thousands of years, but we don't really know what humans were up to thousands of years ago. So we don't know exactly how Piper Mephisticum came around, but it's, it's a unique plant. And it is so unique that the Polynesians, when they migrated to Hawaii uh, in canoes, they actually took these plants with them. And now there's kava in Hawaii. And kava in Hawaii has a very important cultural aspect to it too. And if you look at there's a great book uh, on kava. It's called Kava, the Pacific Elixir. Uh, Erica could link it in the description below. It is written in part by Vincent Lebeau, who's one of the primary kava researchers. And in this book, he goes through all of the different cultures that use kava and what they use it for. And one purpose that they use it for is this social lubricant where it has this nice relaxing GABAergic effect that makes it easier to talk. I think we are demonstrating that right here. We're, we're a little bit more jovial. We're a little bit more back and forth than we usually are. And I, I 
really like this about kava. I always like drinking some kava and chatting with people. Um, but then beyond that, you see it being used for pain. So all sorts of different pains and ailments kava is being used. Um, so that's also why it's in, in our stack. Also because we've played around with kava many, many times and we always notice that it has quite a strong pain management effect. And it's coming through multiple different mechanisms. So kava is acting as a GABA-A agonist. This is one of the primary GABAergic receptors. And this causes our muscles to relax a little bit. And it causes our perception of pain to be lowered. And it puts us in a more calm and positive mood, which helps with the overall psychological experience of pain. Then on top of that, kava contains compounds like yangonin, which are agonists at the cannabinoid CB1 receptor. So there's quite a significant cannabinoid aspect to CAVA as well, which also helps with the psychological experience of pain, but also directly helping with inflammation and oxidation. And beyond that, you have compounds in CAVA like uh, dihydrocaffeine and dihydromethysticin, which are very strong COX-2 inhibitors. COX-2 is a, is a common target for pain management compounds, and CAVA seems to do it very strongly. Uh, so we have an inflammation reducing effect, we have an oxidation reducing effect, and we have that GABAergic and cannabinoid effect. That together builds a really strong base and is what gives it such a unique effect. Now, to build on that, we added in lemon balm to build out the GABAergic portion a little bit more. So in lemon balm, there's a compound called rosmarinic acid, which I mentioned. Ours is standardized to 1% rosmarinic acid. And rosmarinic acid inhibits an enzyme called GABA transaminase, or abbreviated to GABA-T. Now, GABA transaminase takes GABA and degrades it into glutamate. So if you block this enzyme, then there's a less conversion of GABA to glutamate, which means that you have more GABA. And this works quite well together with the effects of CAVA. It, it enhances the, the GABAergic effects because now the, the CAVA lactones, the, the bioactives in CAVA, are directly activating the GABA-A receptor. And now you also have just more GABA floating around because it's not being broken down as quickly. Think of GABA transaminase as like a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, but for GABA. Um, and rosmarinic acid also has some oxidation and inflammation lowering effects. So th that works well together with the inflammation and oxidation regulating effects of CAVA. Now, beyond that, we have the, the maca, and the maca is standardized to the 5% macamides, like I mentioned earlier, which is important because the macamides are fatty acid amide hydrolase. This is called FA. And this is an, it's an inhibitor of this enzyme, FA. And FA normally breaks down endocannabinoids like anandamide, 2-AG, palmitoyl ethanolamide, uh, oleol ethanolamide, and, and various different endocannabinoids. FA degrades these endocannabinoids, meaning there's lower amounts of them. So when you inhibit FA, you get higher amounts of endocannabinoids. And there's actually a genetic mutation that <laughs> they gave a really funny name. Uh, they call it far out. So like far out, man, but far out. And people with the far out um, genetic mutation, they basically don't feel pain. They're also generally in a very positive mood and experience very little anxiety. Uh, and this is because those people are not breaking down their endocannabinoids as readily. So their cannabinergic tone is much higher. Now, we don't want to completely eliminate pain, as we talked about. Experiencing pain is important, but it's interesting to note that people who genetically have very low amounts of fa activity also have very low perception of pain. Mm -hmm. So by inhibiting fa with the macamides, we can simulate this effect a little bit, uh, allowing just general pain to go down. I need to make an, inter an interjection mm -hmm. because I'm curious to know if the difference in pain perception between men and women this is something that's been researched, mm -hmm. is related to a difference in this fa. 
it, it could be and and interestingly enough this uh, uh case report that i was reading was actually on a female subject mm. um so yeah maybe just genetically there are differences in in fa maybe women have lower fa activity than men i'm, I'm not sure uh, this is, is a note for further research yes that but... would be that would be great to research but just generally speaking it seems like if you if you target fa and you you block that enzyme activity endocannabinoids go up and that then obviously works synergistically together with the endocannabinoid the cannabinoid modulating effects of kava so you get kava is activating the cb1 receptor now you're breaking down less anandamide anandamide is an endogenous cb1 receptor agonist so by combining kava and maca we are just dialing up that endocannabinoid tone which i think is very important for overall pain and also mood and relaxation uh, for example, if you're taking fish oil, the omega-3s are important for making endogenous cannabinoids too, and fish oil generally seems to help people with pain management as well, and also with mood. So the cannabinoid system, I think, is very important. It's something that, unfortunately, due to very archaic and, in my opinion, wrong cannabis laws, has not been explored as much as it should have, uh, because cannabis is not the only plant that interacts with the cannabinoid system and actually a lot of different plants interact with it even immune modulators like echinacea actually are quite potent cannabinoid modulating compounds so it's a very amazing receptor system that we just don't understand well enough yet in my opinion and, and hopefully with changing laws uh, we can actually do some more research on that and, and figure out different strategies of making endocannabinoid type medications or supplements work. Interestingly enough, there is no pharmaceutical fat inhibitor yet. All of them have failed, but we see some in nature that seem to work quite well, like the macamides. Um, or, for example, we, we just released Caloriburn, uh, a grains of paradise extract, which is standardized to 6-paradol. And 6-paradol also seems to be a pretty potent fat inhibitor. So I think over time we're going to discover more and more natural fat inhibitors. And yeah, hopefully we can do something with this and, and look at the cannabinoid system uh, away from the, the legislative mess that cannabis has created. You mentioned that Caloriburn is also working through this FA mechanism. Mm -hmm. And uh, refresh my memory, did we take Caloriburn or Mitoburn in our new product? Burn. Okay, in our new yeah. product video. So for any of you who have seen the new product video, then you know what we're talking about. But if you haven't seen the new product video, uh, we introduced five new products, one of which is Caloriburn. And Emil and I both took a dose of it. And we have been experimenting with this product because it gives a really nice relaxing and warming effect. And it also seemed to um, dial down our just general soreness and our, our general malaise, as we like to call it, <laughs> because of this cold that we've had. Yeah. Um, so really interesting that you bring it up because this is also working through that same FA mechanism, mm -hmm. um, calorie burn and relief X. Absolutely. Um, so if we stay in cannabinoid land or endocannabinoid land, uh, then we can move on to two other ingredients that we have in here. So one of them is tetrahydromagnolol, which is, a, as we mentioned earlier, quite a potent cannabinoid CB2 agonist. Um, the interesting thing is that the, the CB1 receptors are expressed more throughout our central nervous system and our peripheral nervous system, and it con controls a little bit more the psychological experience of pain. And that's why things that activate CB1 to a high degree are also quite psychoactive. CB2, on the other hand, is a re cannabinoid receptor that is mostly expressed on immune cells. And immune cells play a major role in managing inflammation. So if we activate these CB2 receptors, that causes more of a reduction in overall inflammation and doesn't produce as much of a psychoactive effect because the CB2 receptor isn't expressed as uh, abundantly throughout the central nervous system and activation of it doesn't really produce a, a profound psychoactive effect. I do find that tetrahydromagnolol still has a, a bit of a psychoactive effect. Um, and that might also be because it is a very mild agonist of the CB1 receptor. 
And again, in the overall context of ReliefX, we keep hitting these same targets over and over with multiple different compounds, which should increase their the overall product's effectiveness on those receptors, a bit of a synergistic effect. So we have multiple different CB1 agonists, we have the macamides, we have cava, and we have tetrahydromagnolol, and then we have uh, the CB2 agonism coming from tetrahydromagnolol, and I, I, that, that might actually be it. it. It might just be tetrahydromagnolol that's hitting the CB2 receptor. Um, we also have palmitoyl ethanolamide in there, which is an endogenous cannabinoid. And palmitoyl ethanolamide is also degraded by FA. So an interesting thing about that is that when you take palmitoyl ethanolamide, you're actually giving FA a substrate to chew on. Uh, so FA is then busy. If there's a lot more palmitoyl ethanolamide floating around, then you don't have to maybe hydrolyze as much anandamide or 2-AG because you kind of have your sacrificial palmitoyl ethanolamide now. So if you combine it then with maca, which is a FA inhibitor, and palmitoyl ethanolamide is also acting as a FA inhibitor, but more importantly, palmitoyl ethanolamide itself has direct effects on the, the PPAR system, which has a, a modulatory role on inflammation and pain perception. So if you combine a FA inhibitor with palmitoyl ethanolamide, then you actually can have more palmitoyl ethanolamide floating around too. So MACA and PEA are then synergistic. All right, so that really covers the, the endocannabinoid aspect of it. We've also covered the GABAergic aspect of it, and those really go well together. Both of those can produce physical relaxation, muscle relaxation, which is what Eric and I have been feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel a, a lot looser. Um, unfortunately, this is now not there because it wasn't the, the first recording attempt, but I was saying there that Kind of my upper back has been a little bit sore because I've been sitting a lot more recovering from this illness. And my, my neck is a little bit sore from sitting in bad positions, laying in bed and still trying to work a little bit here and there. So now I'm feeling that a lot of that tension is being relieved, which for me now would mean it's going to be really easy to do a little bit of a stretching session, a little bit of foam rolling after this episode, and that's really nice. And and also, what I was saying earlier, it's also really nice to just take and watch a movie because you'll kind of just melt into the couch, you'll be really physically relaxed, it's, it's great. I, I would say also if you, for example, we like going to a sauna that has a very nice relaxing effect or or take, going in a hot tub or something. If you take something like Relievix and do that, you're just going to double up on, on that physical relaxation. And if you just take Relievix by itself, it, it kind of feels like, yeah, you took a really nice warm shower, your muscles are also a little bit warm, and that brings us then to the TRPV3 effects of the supercritical Boswellia extract, because that's where that's coming from. The TRPV3, this is a type of vanilloid receptor, and the vanilloid receptors respond to heat. So for the TRPV3 receptor, the activation heat is between 30 and 39 degrees Celsius. So this would be like a, a warm shower, a sauna, um, a hot tub or something like that would also be activating these TRPV3 receptors. And TRPV3 has a, a pretty integral role in pain and both activation and deactivation of TRPV3 seems to have a uh, pain modulating effect. In our case, we are dealing with a TRPV3 agonist effect. And what's interesting, if you look at a lot of different cannabinoid type compounds, they end up being vanilloid receptor agonists usually too. And TRPV3 is one of the more common targets. So. Overall, I, I, I've personally never really had a major response to Boswellia extracts until I tried this one. That volatile compound really does something interesting, that warming effect. It's a similar effect that I get with um, Caloriburn, which we were talking about earlier, also definitely has a, a warming effect. And that's because of the TRPV1 receptor, which some of the compounds in ReliefX uh, coming from ginger, the Shogals, uh, which, by the way, Caloriburn also contains shogol and gingerols. It's, it's in a similar type of family. 
uh, those will activate the TRPV1 receptor, which gives you a bit of a, a sense of spiciness too. So capsaicin does that as well. So the, these mechanical receptors that respond to temperature fluctuations, we can use them in, in our advantage and actually make you feel like you're experiencing warmth, even though you're not experiencing warmth. So it's kind of like a, a sauna in a bottle. And, and this effect is coming from the ginger in Relievex, right? Uh, no. But also the Boswellia? It's coming primarily from Boswellia. Sorry, that, okay. that might have been a little bit confusing, but the, the gingerol and the shogaol mm -hmm. are also having effects on the TRPV1 receptor, so there's a bit of warming that's coming from the ginger as well, which if you drink a ginger tea or you take a ginger supplement, it is a little bit warming. If you uh, taste ginger, it it's, has a, a warming sensation, not mm. like a painful spiciness necessarily, like you would have with uh, capsaicin, which is a much stronger TRPV1 agonist, but you also have it with ginger. And it's, it's coming because it's activating this receptor that normally gets activated by heat. If you then activate it with a small molecule like 6 shogol or gingerol capsaicin, it tricks you into believing you got something actually hot on your tongue or throughout your body, which in the case of TRPV3 agonism seems to produce a really interesting effect. Emil and I really like to experiment with this effect because we love to eat Szechuan food mm -hmm. and we have started basically eating at one of our favorite Szechuan restaurants at least once a month for the past six months or so and apart from it being extremely tasty and really different than any other style of food that I have ever eaten in the past before moving to the Netherlands, it's also fascinating because of the intense mental and physical sensation that you have during the actual meal, like when you're eating it and tears are running down my face and, you know, my mucus is moving around and everything starts to open up and my mouth is either on fire or numb. But then also that warming feeling that I have in my stomach once I've finished eating and then the glow and like otherworldly experience I have when I'm walking out of the restaurant after I finish my meal, which usually takes me like 10 to 15 minutes to actually come down from because it really transports you into a different place. Anyways, it's basically a plug for uh, Szechuan food, for spicy food, and the fact that these can be really relaxing. They can also be a little bit pain relieving. And it's no wonder that sometimes we reach for these things when we're feeling a little bit down or sick. And the same concept is basically here in Relievex. It's just not something we're going to be tasting necessarily, mm -hmm. but we're going to be feeling it. Yeah, and, and it's what we're experiencing with the Sichuan food is a lot of TRPV1 activation, which is not going to be as strong in Relievex, but it's going to be pretty strong in Caloraburn. And I actually haven't tried stacking them together yet, but I actually think that would make a, an interesting stack. Uh, but yeah, we, we are big fans of that, that capsaicin feeling. Uh, and it's interesting with the Sichuan because you're also getting these compounds from the Sichuan peppercorns that are very similar to what you're seeing in Acmela with, for example, um, Mitadol, uh, which is a, a ginger and Acmela formulation that we have that also targets the cannabinoid system. And while there's no direct evidence of the Sichuan, uh, they're called the sensuals, uh, they're very similar compounds to the spilanthols that are in um, acmela. In acmela, the spilanthols, they seem to have endocannabinoid effects too. And I would say based on how I've experienced Sichuan peppercorns, there's probably also a bit of endocannabinoid activity going on there. But for sure, both the Sichuan peppercorns and the capsaicin from the chili peppers that are being used have a major effect on the vanilloid receptors. And this is another receptor system that honestly isn't being explored enough, I think, in the pharmaceutical world for pain management, because I, I think there's some really interesting things to discover there, uh, combining lots of the different uh, vanilloid receptor agonists. And interestingly enough, we've been using this topically uh, for a long time. For example, Tiger Balm works because it activates those TRPV1 three uh, type receptors because of the, the camphene that's in there uh, from camphor. Um, and you have things like menthol in there, which I believe are acting on the TRPM8 receptor, which usually gets activated by cold. So when you activate it with something like menthol, you get the sensation of coolness. And 
perhaps also some of the benefits associated with that. So if you apply that on a, a sore muscle, you're going to get a, both a heating and a cooling effect because you're activating all of these vanilloid receptors. But you can do that orally too, which clearly has some very interesting effects. People have been having uh, really good results with the supercritical CO2 boswellia extract as a standalone. And I think within the stack, with some of that ginger in there too, it, it really rounds everything out and makes that physically relaxed feeling a little bit more pronounced because it brings a level of warmth to it too, which just kind of makes you feel like you got a nice cozy blanket over you and you're ready to just kind of relax and, and chill out and hopefully have the, the pain go away a little bit so you, you, you can get a bit of a break from that. Now... Are the, there any more ingredients that we've missed? There are two more. Okay. Um, so ginger, which we've talked about multiple times. Ginger was in there for a, a multitude of reasons. And one of which, the primary one that we first put it in for, is when you're experiencing a lot of pain, sometimes you also experience quite a bit of nausea. For me, that's, that's a big thing I have when I'm having a migraine. Uh, I almost always have the sensation of nausea too. And when I've been in, in really severe pain, I also feel nausea. So this also seems to be a pretty common occurrence. Um, actually, when I was given these opioid medications in the US when I broke my wrist, I was also given something that acts as a very strong 5-HT3A antagonist, um, which is what ginger does as well. So To prevent nausea. To prevent nausea. Uh, so <laughs> ginger is a serotonin 5-HT3A antagonist, and when you activate the 5-HT3A receptor within your gut, you get the sensation of nausea. When you block it, that sensation of nausea goes away. So that's one of the reasons why we have ginger in here. The other is, of course, because of its effects on the vanilloid receptor. Uh, and ginger has some beneficial effects on controlling inflammation and oxidation. So that, that is a really nice one to just round out the, the whole um, stack. Uh, and then we have piperine. So piperine is really the, the last ingredient that rounds everything out because it can help increase the bioavailability of some of the, the compounds that are in Relievex. And additionally, it has its own inflammation and oxidation regulating effects and it has some direct effects on pain too. So when we added in piperine, uh, the, the pain modulating effects went up by, by a pretty significant margin. So we really like it for that. Uh, and yeah. How Let many ingredients just, uh, is that then? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ingredients. Eight ingredients. A and all at just basically full doses. For example, the kava isn't at a full dose. It is at a half dose uh, for two reasons. Kava is very expensive. So if we put in a full dose, it would have made this product very, very expensive. Uh, but you can always take a double dose if you want that full kava dose. But additionally, because we are combining the GABAergic effects of kava with the GABAergic effects of lemon balm and the cannabinergic effects of kava with the cannabinergic effects of palmitoyl, ethanolamide, tetrahydromagnolol, and um, I'm, I'm losing the plot here a bit. <laughs> You're talking about GABA. And, and maca. No, I was talking about the cannabinoid effect. Sorry, you're talking about the <laughs> cannabinoid effect. <laughs> I've got a lot of concepts running around in my head now, but we round out the GABAergic and the cannabinoid effects of kava with other ingredients, which one allows it to actually put it in a two capsule dose. If we went for a full kava dose, it, that's also a gram. So it's, it's a very vol, vol, voluminous uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, ingredient. So it takes up a lot of space and it's quite expensive. So that's why you see a lower dose of kava, but the rest of the ingredients are all kind of there right at where you want them to be, even as a standalone. So this produces really potent effects. And actually the effects are so potent that even a single capsule dose works really well. So my mom, when she takes really sick, she just takes a single capsule. I don't think she's ever even taken the full two capsule dose. Uh, and the single capsule dose works so well, there's no reason to go up. So keep that in mind too, when you're taking Relievex, maybe even start with one capsule, uh, especially if your pain isn't really severe. But if it is quite bad, start at the full two capsule dose and you can also go up from there. Um, I, I've tried it at a three capsule dose and at a four capsule dose and it scales quite nicely. 
Um, but other than that, we've we've covered everything within ReliefX. I think you have a pretty good idea of what it's doing because you can also see it in us. And we've uh, had a really good opportunity to talk about our actual experience with it. Uh, and, and I hope that that tells you a little bit more about ReliefX and how interesting of a product that is because we're targeting pain from so many different areas. And I would really say if, if you look at what this is, it is also just a strong cannabinoid modulator, which is unique um, and I think has a lot of applications. Some applications that we haven't necessarily explored with ReliefX is that maybe if you're having some gastrointestinal issues, uh, CB2 agonists seem to help quite a bit. Uh, and things like ginger also help. So if you're having gastrointestinal types of discomfort and maybe even pain, this could help too. Uh, I haven't seen that many reports of it yet, but I have seen some reports of people using some of our other cannabinoid focused supplements like Refl or just tetrahydromagnol by itself. And those seem to work quite well for some gastrointestinal issues. So it, it could be beneficial there too. Um, but I think just in terms of its uh, flexibility too, where you can use it as a relaxation aid, you can use it as a mood boosting supplement, you can use it as a, a pain modulator, you can use it uh, at night for sleep. Oh, that is one thing I... See I, the bottle actually? Yes. Thanks. That is one thing I do want to touch on. Oftentimes, the real issue with pain is that you also can't sleep because... The pain keeps you up, you're tossing and turning, and ooh, ow, that hurts. I, I experienced this with my wrist. My sleep quality was really bad, and that slows down recovery too. Now, if you can get rid of some of that pain and improve your sleep quality, then you'll probably have a, a better success in getting over maybe an injury or getting to a point where ideally you wouldn't need relief X, right? Like, there's many products that we would recommend you you take every single day. The effects build up. You get more of a nootropic effect, more of a, um, a mood boosting effect. I guess in that sense, relief X is nice to take on a daily basis because the mood boosting effects will increase too. But the the concept behind relief X is also to to get rid of what's causing the pain to allow you to maybe do some more physical activity, some stretching, physical therapy, whatever it may be, so that you don't have to be on a pain management supplement your whole life. Um, it, it can be beneficial. Eric and I take anti-inflammatories and antioxidants every day. They, they just generally help with, with lots of different things. And, and that is something that's attenuating pain on a daily basis. So you can definitely take relief X on a daily basis. But the whole concept is that this is going to push you into an area where maybe hopefully you don't need relief X on a daily basis. And the reason why I wanted to look at the bottle um, is for this exact reason, because I wanted to refresh my memory and see what was written on the bottle itself. And you can probably read it here. It says relaxation and pain support. So the first effect that's listed on the bottle is relaxation. Mm -hmm. And the second is pain support. And I think that's probably important to mention um, because relaxation is such an important part of managing pain. And this is the effect that I can sense the most throughout the podcast from when we took this until now. I feel very relaxed and mm -hmm. I feel more relaxed than I have in quite a long time. So I think I'm probably going to um, change the way I'm thinking about Relief X as not only something to manage pain, but also to manage mood um, and a little bit of stress because I've been thinking of it more as like an acute physical pain management product, but after sitting here without an acute pain uh, to address, but feeling all that calm and relaxation coming through, now I'm thinking, okay, this is this is a different product. And I also understand it differently after talking about all the ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, I take a lot of these products and most of them just as often as Emil does, but I don't have the same background, the same scientific background, or all of those hours of reading research to inform you about the science behind it, but I can tell you how I experience it in terms of the sensation um, or the way that it affects my mood. Mm -hmm. So I love these podcasts because I learn so much about the products that I'm actually taking, and that changes my perception of basically what I sense when I actually 
take them at all. So I hope this has been really illuminating for you as well. And if you haven't tried Relief X before, perhaps now you can think of a couple different reasons why it might be interesting to try for the relaxation and the mood effects, but also for the actual physical relief effects that it has. And because there's eight ingredients in here, it's going to be a really powerful, but also more full spectrum stack product. So this can also kind of tick some different boxes if you're looking for a relaxation product to add to your stack, or if you need something to help you with sleep, to help you with stress and some of these other kind of lifestyle elements that can contribute to pain as well. And one thing that I will mention as well, there's a lot of ingredients in it. It's quite powerful. It is also quite expensive because of that. But because the effects are quite potent and very acute, within half an hour I can feel them quite strongly, and then within an hour they're at peak effects. This is something you can also just keep in, in your, your medicine cabinet, and when you injure yourself or you're having a very stressful day, just take a dose. This is not something you have to take every day to get the maximum amount of benefits from it. Um, and that's how we use ReliefX. I'm not taking ReliefX every day. Uh, my mom also isn't taking ReliefX every day. It's more of a, oh, I'm in a position now where I, I took a misstep on a hike and my knee is sore. I will take a dose of ReliefX oh, it, it's a little bit better, take another one the next day, the next day, and then, oh, I don't need it anymore, back in the medicine cabinet. Just as you would use other over-the-counter pain management type of products. I'm, I'm also not taking ibuprofen every day, but if I'm having a really bad migraine, it's there for me and I have it. So that's where Relievix lives for us. Um, and of course, Eric and I don't have the experience of chronic everyday pain so for us it's it's a little bit easier to say oh, you can just take it every once in a while for someone like my dad who had a hernia uh, that that first year of, of hernia was really tough uh, he couldn't walk at, at certain points so for my dad at that point it, it would have been very beneficial to take relief x every single day and when you do take relief x every day the palmitoyl ethanolamide that's in there it takes a little bit to get going to really reach its peak effects. Uh, so it will increase in efficacy if you take it for, let's say, three to four weeks. You will see uh, maybe another bump in efficacy there. Um, and this makes it a, a really good product for people who are experiencing chronic back pain or some chronic nerve issues. Uh, and, and then uh, now I feel a little bit bad saying this is maybe more of an every once in a while thing but from my perspective. But if you're in, in a scenario where you need that kind of help every single day and there's no other better option, this is a fantastic option to take on a daily basis and you definitely can take it on a daily basis. And I don't imagine there would be a quick rise in tolerance or anything like that. So it, it should stay quite stable. And we do have actually, I think, one or two people in the office that are taking it much more regularly, like almost on a daily basis, and they seem to be having good effects with it. Um, yeah. That brings That's us to really the end next. of the podcast. <laughs> I keep thinking there's more to say because it's such a, a complex product and there's a lot to say about it, but I think we covered everything quite well. For sure. We could go on and on for you know the next week talking about <laughs> the philosophy of pain and how we perceive yeah. it and um, how it affects us throughout our lives and, and all of this stuff. But I think we've done a pretty good job of uh, informing you of what our perspective is. So now we want to know what your perspective is. And first, we definitely want to know, have you tried ReliefX for yourself? Have you experienced any benefits from it? And then also, what questions do you have about ReliefX or what do you want to know more about that we maybe didn't touch on in the podcast? If you have questions or feedback, you can always tell us in the comments on YouTube. You can write to us on Reddit. Our subreddit is r slash Nootropics Depot. You can even comment on the podcast on some different streaming platforms like on Spotify. And we really love to read your feedback. So please don't be shy. Tell us what you think and ask us your question. And speaking of questions, we also have a follow-up Q&A post that we put onto our subreddit r slash Nootropics Depot the week after the podcast is released so that you can ask your question and have it 
answered by a meal or product specialist. So don't miss out on that one. Thanks so much for listening. And thanks so much for sharing the In Search of Insight podcast with your friends. We will see you next month. And until then, bye bye for now. See ya. See ya.